recording, so everyone should know that the the uh, presentation portion of this meeting is going to be recorded, and we're going to do our very best to share it with you on the website. On our website, um, we do have it functioning this month, unlike last month. So you are now being recorded. And my name is Chris Geiger. I'm the IPM coordinator for the City and County of San Francisco, in case you, you've never attended one of these events. And um, let me just, uh, if we were meeting in person, we would do a round robin right about now and kind of check in. I don't think that really makes sense in this format, um, but we will have plenty of chance for discussion later. And that discussion part will not be recorded just so you know. So you can, you know, feel free to ask any questions that come to mind with regard to the general topic of IPM. Um, here's the general agenda. And it, I, I, if I could ask people to turn on your video right for the beginning, it's kind of nice to see people's faces instead of their, you know, icons or, you know, posed photos or whatever, <laughs> whatever. Hello, hi everyone. <laughs> Good morning, oh, someone's in, oh wow. All the different environments people are in, it's amazing. Um, it's kind of half the entertainment of this, is seeing what, what the backgrounds are. That looks like an American flag mask. OK, cool. Um, so for those of you who have never attended, this is a more or less monthly event. We've been doing this for over 20 years with the, the city's integrated pest management program. We try to bring you a speaker that is uh, timely and relevant to the general topic of integrated pest management. And we also, as you probably know, um, offer continuing education credits. Um, I want to say up front that um, we heard your comments last time about using Teams for these events. And we're going to try to move away from Teams. As soon as we can get that Zoom subscription happening, we're going to switch over to Zoom, I hope. Um, and that will also make some of the logistics easier. We seem to be having people checking in from other parts of the state now. And so it may involve a registration in order to um, partake in the, um, the uh, meeting. So we're going to have this introduction, turn on the video. Uh, we're going to go through announcements. And our main speaker today is Cody Cifuentes Winter. He's the supervisory vegetation ecologist for Mid Peninsula Regional Open Space District. And I'm delighted to have him join us today. Uh, following that, uh, we'll have Q&A. And, and then we have our kind of traditional IPM problem solving session, which is your chance to ask each other questions. And we'll try to put some structure on that uh, as best we can by using the raising hands function. Um, for those of you who are here uh, seeking continuing education credits for Department of Pesticide Regulation, here is how the system works. Um, you attend the meeting, you watch it, you listen. You uh, At the end of the meeting, we will give you uh, an exam. They require an exam now. For these virtual meetings and you have to score a 70 percent and then we will send you the results so so here's here are some tips so we have the ability to mute everyone but sometimes that doesn't work so please make sure that you're muted during this uh, meeting uh, and there's the little button if you click on your screen you should see this menu um, can you all see the instruction screen? Can it, someone just raise their hand if you can see it? You can see it? Okay, good. Um, uh, during the Q&A, here's the raise your hand button. And Jesse and Troy will be uh, kind of managing that and calling on people and unmuting you when, it's, when you'd like to speak. We may try, if it's not too chaotic, we may try it at first without that. So. Um, we're going to play it by ear. Sometimes uh, it works to not have to use the raise your hand, but probably we will. Whoops, sorry. Um, 
and then, like I said, there's an exam at the end. And the way we're, we have to make sure uh, to give you that at the end of the meeting. And see the little, the chat bubble is what you will click. And we will give you a link for that exam at that time. We'll also give you a link for a speaker evaluation. And thank you very much for those of you who fill out the speaker evaluation forms. It's super helpful. And that's basically it. So um, pro tip, uh, if, if you uh, are clicking on the chat button and you get a message that says you were removed for the meeting, don't freak out. It might just mean your internet stopped working for a moment. Uh, so that's just one of those little wrinkles with Teams. If you want to share a link via chat, and I do encourage you to chat. You can use the chat all you want to talk during the meeting with each other. Uh, that's just fine. It's kind of recorded for posterity. But uh, if you would like to share a link, uh, don't put a slash at the end. I know that's kind of trivia. But it doesn't work if you put a slash at the end. People will have trouble. OK. So um, having said that, I'm going to move on to announcements. And I'm going to start with my announcements. And then we'll go to anyone from the group who has announcements about events uh, or happenings or issues that have come up recently or things that we should have on our calendar, that sort of stuff. Number one. We've been talking about this for months now, but we finally do have a new database for, recor for recording pesticide use on city properties. And this is only a small number of you who are on this call, but I want to just point out while I have the chance that our database is complete. We are hoping to switch over to that database on September 1st. Between now and then, we're scheduling two dates to have a, an online training on how to use it. It is pretty simple. It's, you know, you could probably figure it out without a training, but uh, it's, uh, you should do the training anyway. And um, so you should watch your calendar. If you are one of those people, one of those members of the technical advisory committee who are entering pesticide data for use on city properties, um, you'll need to take this training. Uh, and it's going to be, I think, a lot more trouble free. We've designed this so it's not going to be breaking down. So it's not going to be um, having weird data problems that we had with the last one. So really excited to bring this online. Um, along those lines, those of you who are entering data, please do it ASAP this month. ASAP because we are cutting off the old database at the end of this month, and we want to have as much of, we want to get all that uh, of the August data in. So um, please do um, enter that. If you have a problem with entering it by the end of the month, contact me directly and we'll find a way to do it. Okay. So that's the new database coming up. It was a, it's a big, it was a big effort to put this together. We're super happy that it's happening. Um, second announcement, this is sort of a set of announcements. This is our calendar, upcoming calendar. Um, uh, those of you who are on the Commission on the Environment notification list received this uh, uh, announcement and also are on our email list. The annual public hearing regarding pest management activities on city properties is scheduled for this coming Monday, August 10th. 5 to 7 p.m. Check your email uh, for or, or our website events listing for the relevant links to that. It's a WebEx event. There are some special procedures because it's a public hearing. And that's I can't just put the, the link here. So uh, that's this Monday. Those of you who are involved already know it. Um, but others are Welcome and encouraged to join us. This is our annual occasion to hear feedback from the community and also for us uh, as city staff to help better communicate all the things that we do on the ground. Um, I already mentioned the switch to the new database, September 1st. 
And then our annual pesticide list process is underway. Uh, as most of you know, every year we update and refresh and winnow out the uh, the chaff from our um, reduced risk pesticide list for city properties. Um, and that has to be approved by our Commission on the Environment. That's going to the Policy Committee on the Commission, September 14th, 5 to 7 p.m. You'll see announcements for that. And skipping down, it will be finally approved, we hope, at the full Commission on the Environment meeting, September 22nd from 5 to 7 p.m. So those are things you might want to put on calendar. Um, it's, it's a good thing to have people at these meetings uh, to uh, set the record straight on what kind of work you do and what sort of concerns and uh, uh, you have with the work and also, you know, just your, um, your dedication to the cause. This program has been such a wonderful um, uh, group of like-minded individuals over the years. And uh, I think it's really special in that way. I miss meeting you all face-to-face. -face. Um, and then we have, oops, sorry. We also, uh, for September's IPM TAC meeting, we scheduled Carolyn Whitesell. She is the new Human Wildlife Interactions Advisor for UC Cooperative Extension. She's fantastic. She's got lots of experience and some great stories. Um, I think the title maybe doesn't do her justice, uh, Burrowing Rodent Coyote Management, uh, but she's going to be telling lots of stories about animals and humans interacting with animals. So um, join us for that, and we will have continuing education credits for that event as well. So um, I think now I'm going to uh, oops, I'm going to ask if anyone in the audience has uh, some announcements they would like to make. And if so, uh, please raise your hand. And Jesse, and if you could uh, kind of manage that, please, that would be great. Uh, let's see. Any hands? Jesse, and if you're talking, we can't hear you. Um, I don't see any hands. I'm, I'm on my iPad, though. Um, I don't see any hands. Actually, there. Okay, hold on. Well, there's one. There's our speaker. Uh, Cody, hold on a second. Oh. Hold on a second, it's a little awkward, but we will unmute you. Or you can unmute yourself actually. Cody, can you go ahead? Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to quickly mention, I know I'm the speaker later, but um, right now MidPin is advertising for a new manager. Um, it's a land and facilities manager. Um, and what they uh, are in charge with is um, all the land and facilities of MidPin, which includes maintenance of trails, it is capital improvement projects, uh, it is resource management. Uh, so they oversee uh, quite a large crew um, and that advertisement is live right now. And if anybody's interested, uh, please feel free to reach out to me and I can send you that announcement. Fabulous. Thank you, Cody. And, and I'd be happy if you send that to me, I can send it on to the list, Cody. Will do. Okay, any other announcements from the group? Don't be shy. Going once, going twice. Everyone's looking for their little hand button. Okay. Oh, there we go. Uh, Peter, Peter Brasson. Hi, I just have a question. Yeah. Um, did you get us organic coffee this morning? And I'll take my answer off the air. <laughs> Absolutely, organic fair trade. It's in your freezer, I hope. 
Yeah, we're, we're sparing no expense here. Um, okay. Anybody else? I don't see any other hands, Chris. Okay. All right. Hearing that, I think it's time then we'll go on to, we'll move on to the main speaker. Uh, Cody Cifuentes Winter um, uh, has, uh, actually you've just been promoted, uh, as I understand. I used to know you as the IPM coordinator. Um, and Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District is a huge amount of land that some people may not even realize they're on when they're using it. Um, and it presents, a hu I'm sure, uh, a, a, a lot of the, the same challenges in habitat management and pest, pest management and weed management in general that we face here in the city and that maybe some of the other cities on the call face or other agencies. So I'm really delighted and really happy, Cody, that you could join us. And uh, I'd like to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, good morning, all. Uh, like Chris said, my name is Cody C. Fuentes Winter, and I'm the Supervisory Vegetation Ecologist uh, for MidPen. I've been there for about five years now. Um, prior to that, I was at the National Park Service um, for a while and also with the U.S. Forest Service. Um, today, I just wanted to, to discuss with everybody about sort of the vegetation management that we do on mid-pin lands and how we do that work. Um, in December of 2014, we actually finalized a environmental impact report um, and we adopted our integrated pest management program, uh, which was at the time about 62,000 acres. Um, you know, prior to having a uh, integrated pest management program, we did follow IPM principles. We just didn't have it documented very well. And so this, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so uh, we went through this process, a uh, pretty lengthy process to get this program up and running. Uh, a little background about MidPen. Uh, we're an independent special district. Uh, we have seven duly elected uh, directors uh, throughout San Mateo and Santa Clara County. We actually spanned uh, a little bit also into Santa Cruz County as well. Uh, at this point, we have nearly 65,000 acres of public land, um, and that's in 26 open space preserves. Of those 26 open space preserves, 24 of them are open to the public. So uh, our mission uh, when we first started in 1972 was a little bit more skilled back than what you see here. Um, in the 2000s, we actually annexed part of the San Mateo coast. And part of that annexation was that we expanded our mission. And that expansion included the preservation of rural character, uh, encouraging viable agricultural use of land uh, resources. And those were on top of um, the original three-pronged uh, mission, which was to acquire and preserve open space, protect and restore the natural environment, and provide ecologically sensitive public enjoyment and education. So as I said, uh, we're in three different uh, counties. Um, on our lands, we have about 110 buildings, a little over 300 miles of roads and trails, 31 miles of disc lines, 39 helicopter spots. Um, we preserved about 11,000 acres of rangeland, but of those 11,000, about 8,500 is actively managed as rangeland. About 360 active uh, um, acres of row crops. We have Christmas tree farms, we have orchard, orchards, and about 866 invasive plant sites um, that we deal with on an annual basis. So really quickly by the numbers, uh, as I said, we are 65,000 65, acres, um, but that is not completely open to the public. So open to the public is about 31,000 acres, and we have another 600 or so acres that are open via permit only. Uh, 23 restrooms, 15 picnic tables, uh, 245 miles um, of that 300 that I mentioned is available to the public. Um, 
Uh, most of it is hiking use with uh, some bicycle use, about 160 acres and about 220 acres uh, available to uh, horses. So as I said about um, our IPM program in 2014, when we went through the process to develop it, prior to that, uh, we relied heavily on uh, the California Environmental Quality Act under the categorical exemption of the maintenance of existing landscape, native growth, and water supply reservoirs. Um, it was updated and it, it explicitly um, excluded the use of pesticides, which is something that uh, we do use um, and so uh, that was part of the reason why we decided to go through this uh, process of the IPM program. So uh, one of the first things we did was sort of come up with our definition of integrated pest management. Um, and what you see on the screen is what we came up with, uh, which is a long-term science-based decision-making system that specifically assesses pest control alternatives and monitoring site conditions. Um, and really we're trying to effectively control target pests with minimal impacts to human health, the environment and non-target organisms. So what this really means is that all methods uh, we are looking at is really trying to minimize any outside impacts that uh, we do not want to see. Some of the key concepts of our program, uh, making sure that we have the knowledge base if we do not have it in house, uh, which I do say we have uh, 12 amazing people in our natural resources department. Um, everything from cultural resources to geology, forestry, uh, vegetation um, and wildlife. Um, but when we don't have that knowledge base, uh, we do reach out to consultants um, and other partner agencies to try to uh, bridge that gap for us. Uh, one of the other key concepts was safety um, and then thresholds and priorities. You know, how do we determine when we go into the site to do work? Uh, not every uh, non-native weed is an issue. And so we need to make sure that we understand that and prioritize our work accordingly. Uh, I'm sure as in uh, every other agency, uh, resources are not, uh, you know, uh, uh, finite. Uh, they are finite, I should say. Um, so we want to make sure that we're, we're putting those resources to the uh, good work. Uh, we want to make sure that we're monitoring our work and that we adjust our work as we go. Um, and then we want to make sure we notify the public and report to the public. And the ways we do this, I'll get into in a little bit. Um, but one of the bigger things that we uh, do is we do do a public meeting every year. It's the annual IPM report that we do. We'll actually be giving that report next week on Wednesday um, evening. So if you are uh, bored and want to listen in, uh, please feel free to do so at seven o'clock. And then, of course, we repeat this annually. Uh, maintenance is one of the biggest things for IPM is making sure you're staying on top of what you're doing. Uh, we want to make sure that, as we said in that uh, definition, that this is long term. Uh, we don't want to go into a site, uh, do some weeding, uh, get out of site, let it blow back up and then come back in a couple of years later um, and have to start the project all over again. So when we developed our IPM program, it started off with our IPM guidance manual, which went through um, all the different activities that we do on our land. Uh, we have actually, we determined uh, five different categories of IPM work that we did, and that's captured in the guidance manual. Part of that, um, we do allow the use of certain uh, pesticides, uh, both herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, and such. And so to ensure that we were doing the minimum impact that we talked about earlier, uh, we did have a very thorough toxicological report that was completed for us. Uh, this toxicological report was done in 2015. And so, of course, uh, over the past five years, uh, science has really taken off on certain aspects. And a lot of information has been coming out about certain pesticides, both 
uh, toxicologically to humans, but also to the environment. And so we make sure that we stay up to date on that science and uh, during the annual IPM report, report out any new data that has come out and we make suggestions uh, to our board recommendations about how we should change our program to uh, make it better, to make it safer and make it more effective. Um, after we got through the guidance memo, we did start the EIA process, uh, the environmental impact report, where they look at all the different um, things that we are doing um, and basically give us an assessment of, hey, this is the impacts that you can expect uh, to uh, biology, to the recreation, um, to all the CEQA uh, requirements that uh, have been laid out in the law. Uh, there's you know, quite a number of different categories. And then based off of those, uh, come up with mitigation and or best management practices that we can put in place to mitigate, to lessen those impacts. So as I said, the IPM program is a living document. So we definitely made sure to write into the program that we would be updating this program on a regular basis. So this is not a program that we just uh, started and then uh, sort of uh, turn our heads away from science and continue on with what we were doing in 2015. So this is definitely a living document and it definitely does change over time. I talked about how we uh, needed to prioritize to make sure we're being effective with our use of um, public money on doing our, our pest management. And so we came up with how do we prioritize pest problems? And so we have this ranking system that we look at. Um, it includes items that are about safety, about preventing and controlling the pest, uh, making sure that that pest um, is uh, one of the more destructive pests that we have on the property and not going after things that uh, might be of very uh, less concern. So we're looking at state and federal noxious weeds. Uh, of course, we're taking Calypsi, the California Invasive Plant Cancel rating into, uh, into um, effect. And then also we're looking at, is this a smaller population? So the early detection rapid response sort of idea, uh, is this the only population of the species at this preserve or nearby? Uh, and making sure we're working on those before we go working and tackling on the you know, hundreds of acres of French broom that we have. Uh, part of what we're trying to do is, of course, preserve biodiversity. So we're making sure that we're working in these areas that uh, have uh, special status species. This could be federally or state listed species, but also it could be just species of special concern. Um, so that list is an active list from both the state and some agent, uh, some non-profit uh, agencies such as the California Native Plant Society. Um, and we take those into um, consideration when we are deciding where we're going to work. Uh, one of the big things for us is that volunteers are a very active and integral part to our program. They provide about 40% of all of our work we do on in our natural land. So they are very important. Um, and so we do have a, a category here um, on uh, one of the criteria is, you know, can the public help us out with this um, project that we have? And then finally, is it feasible? Is it effective? Uh, is what we're going to be doing going to be effective? So um, as you are probably well aware, um, you know, there are certain species that when you cut, they sprout back pretty vigorously, such as French broom or maybe Cantoni aster or something like that. Um, and so uh, the idea is that we're not just going through and maybe brush cutting a whole bunch of broom um, and saying, oh, we did our, our job well here because we don't see French broom anymore. Um, so we want to make sure that it's effective of what we are doing. I alluded to those pest management categories. So as I said, we have a, you know, over 110 buildings. Um, so we need to make sure that those buildings are safe and protected for uh, human users. Uh, we have a lot of recreational facilities. This could be parking lots, the picnic areas that I mentioned, uh, roads and trails. Um, the, uh, we do have a few different farms on our property as well. So we want to make sure that all these recreational facilities, um, the, the 
uh, visitors that we have coming to our lands can experience them in that natural setting and it be safe. We have about that 10,000 acres of rangeland and agricultural lands that we need to work on, which um, as you're probably aware with pesticides brings us into a different type of category when we're doing worker protection um, with rangeland being ag. And then the natural areas. This is probably our largest area that we have um, in terms of our IPM program. Um, the vast majority of our lands are uh, natural areas. And then finally, fire management. Um, and this is to reduce the risk to human life, the property, limit long-term damage to natural resources as a result of wildland fires. So this is uh, something that's very important uh, to the district right now is about fire management. With all the uh, fires that we've had in the past years, um, this was not something that was extremely high on our list when we first did our IPM program in 2015. And so in 2017, I started looking into uh, the, the ability to do prescribed fire on our, our property, both for natural resources protection, but also uh, as a way to reduce fuels. In 2018, though, um, it was decided based off of our earlier discussions in 2017 that um, our fire management really needed to be uh, kicked up a lot. So I've highlighted this here is, is because uh, we are actually in the process right now of developing a wildland fire um, resiliency program. Uh, this is going to more than uh, quadruple our abilities to do work for fire management. And the focus of this fire management program is really on the natural resources and making sure that fires, when they get into the natural areas, uh, that they aren't, it's not catastrophic in that area. Uh, we have a lot of areas that have sudden oak death, a lot of down and dead woody material. Um, and so uh, lots of people think that uh, wildfires are uh, extremely dangerous, which they are. Um, but the thing to keep in mind is that it is not fire coming from wildlands into the urban environment. It's usually the urban environment starting the fires into the wildland areas. Uh, Cal Fire said about 95% of all fires are caused by humans. Uh, so the fire management we're looking at is along roads and trails, along property boundaries that we're really looking at. So I did discuss about the toxicological reports that we did, um, and we wanted to be very thorough on which pesticides we wanted to use uh, for our invasive plant use. Um, so we went through and we came up with our initial list, uh, which was approved by our board of directors. Uh, originally, I believe it was five different um, products that we could use, uh, including glyphosate, amino pyrrolid, um, transline and such. Uh, the one thing that we wanted to make sure, which was very uh, timely of us um, in this day and age, is what happens if we have an emerging human health and safety issue such as COVID-19? Um, we did put a little caveat into our um, IPM program, which said that if there is a human health and safety issue, that the Natural Resources Department can make a determination on the use of a pesticide that is not on our approved list. Um, this would only be for emergency use. Um, it cannot be used uh, long term um, and that we would have to report it to our board of directors and let them know if we felt that we needed to add it to our um, pesticide um, list. So, uh, you know, in 2015, the pandemic was not on our radar, as I don't believe it was on most people's radar. And so uh, we did not have any virucides on our list. Uh, so this allowed us to very quickly um, uh, receive, use um, virucides um, in both our buildings and at our restrooms and such. Um, so it was very important that we had that little thing, uh, that little one sentence that we had in our program to allow us to do this. And so uh, as of right now, we are still using it under the emergency declaration from both um, our district um, by our board of directors, but also by the emergency declaration from the governor. So 
So our best management practices, uh, in 2015, we started off with 30. At this point now, um, as I said, this is a living document. We've added seven more, so we're up to 37 now. Um, and these include everything from uh, making sure that if we are using herbicides, uh, that they are prepared by a licensed pest control advisor. Um, it also talks about uh, the weather conditions, the application requirements, um, how much wind can we have uh, when we're using um, any pesticides. It also goes into uh, non-pesticide use. So we talk about uh, where we can stash um, invasive plant material when we're doing pulling or cutting. Uh, it also talks about uh, surveys requirements. So do we need to do bird nesting surveys? Do we need to do rare plant surveys? Uh, do we need to check for bodies of water nearby? So these best management practices really dictates how we do our environmentally sensitive uh, vegetation management. And the whole idea behind these best management practices is to ensure the safeguards are in place for workers, visitors, and the environment. I talked quickly about the mitigation measures. So these are uh, to lessen impacts that we have on the environment. Um, we had quite a few, uh, inter uh, including cultural resources. Um, much of our land was actually inhabited well before European settlements, um, as probably everybody knows. Um, so we had uh, many Native American tribes throughout our area. And so one of those uh, mitigation measures we had to put in was uh, if we are doing any sort of uh, land um, uh, movement, any sort of a soil movement, um, that we make sure that we've done an archaeological survey prior to it. Now, those surveys could be anything from a desktop um, review of uh, GIS all the way to we actually go out and do a dig or something like that. Um, we did have, um, so the idea is that we don't disturb any cultural resources that might be there. So one of the mitigation measures we have here, is such as uh, if we end up finding human remains, how do we deal with that? Um, and that's very simple. You know, we call the coroner and then we start doing, um, we start reaching out to the Native American tribes to find out if we can find um, the descendants of the remains that might be there. Um, most of our mitigation measures, though, actually settle in on the biological impacts, uh, especially special status wildlife species. Uh, we do have California red-legged frogs. We have foothill yellow-legged frogs, western pine turtles, uh, and San Francisco garter snake. So uh, these mitigation measures help us to work safely around those species um, and make sure that we're not impacting them any more than we need to. So some of the ecologically sensitive management that we do, uh, we try to seasonally time our work to be outside of the bird nest time period. Um, if we do have to do work during the bird nest time period, uh, of course we do those surveys. Uh, when we are doing um, uh, seeding of an area to rehabilitate the area, or maybe we're doing nursery plant plantings, uh, we make sure we're collecting seeds for plant propagation within the same watershed typically. Um, and then we also do pre-management surveys for rare plants. You can see one of our interns on the far right-hand side, she's flagging a Kings Mountain Manzanita, one of the rare plants that we have uh, on our district lands. Uh, we also wash off all of our tools, our equipment, personal protection equipment. Uh, we provide buffers around bodies of water. And we, of course, prioritize invasive species over natives. Um, that last part is very important in terms of um, the fire management aspects that we do. So we want to make sure when we go into an area, prior to us taking out any native species, that we look at the invasive ones first, remove those, then take a look at the site again and say, okay, what do we need to do now to make this fire safe? For all of our pesticides, uh, we do post our pesticides. Um, we do a 72 hour, or 24 hours prior to and 72 hours afterwards. Um, and this let, lets anybody know who's coming into the area that, hey, we are doing a pesticide treatment here, uh, and it allows them to make the decision for themselves. Do they want to come through this area after um, we have deemed it safe? Because, uh, of course, we do keep people out while we're doing the actual application. 
Um, but it allows them to understand, uh, you know, that we did do a spray here, you know, two days ago, um, and it allows them to make that decision if they want to continue on or not. Uh, these are posted um, outside of the treatment area, usually at the junctions of different trails that we have. So that way they don't have to backtrack. Um, so they can uh, make that decision uh, prior to and um, do what they feel is best in their own interest. So again, uh, we post for all of our pesticide use. Our annual work uh, flow that we do, um, I'll start at the top. Um, we start with uh, a staff person proposing a pest management activity. Um, that's reviewed against the IPM guidance manual, and we make sure that that um, is in compliance with what the IPM guidance manual says. So we start this process usually in October, um, where our IPM coordinator, who's online with us right now, uh, Thomas Reyes, um, and so that gets bundled up into an annual work plan. Now we can add projects throughout the year if we need to, but we'd rather go through the annual work plan. Uh, it really streamlines everything for us. Uh, but when we have a project that comes up um, that uh, needs attention more immediately, uh, we can do an individual pest management plan. Uh, that work plan or individual pest management plan goes to our IPM coordinator. And then finally to our IPM coordination team. This is a multidisciplinary team. Um, we have property management specialists on here. We have uh, our some of our um, open space technicians on here, maintenance supervisors, uh, vegetation crew, uh, myself. Uh, and then we also have two managers, the land and facilities manager that uh, I talked about earlier about having that opening right now as well as our natural resource manager. Finally, staff implement the pest management. They monitor and then uh, we have reports. And then this report uh, is uh, put together and presented to our full board for an annual reveal. So at MidPen, uh, we have three different departments that really uh, help us out with uh, the implementation of the IPM program. We got natural resources. Uh, we give the technical support. We do uh, most of the biological surveys, um, though we do have some staff in land and facilities um, that can also do some of those biological surveys for us. Uh, we develop the plans and the report, um, and we do any contract, most of the contract management um, for stuff that we cannot do in-house with our staff. And then we also provide biological monitoring in sensitive sites, such as with San Francisco um, uh, gar garter snake. The land and facilities, they implement uh, the staff projects, um, and then they report on all that work to natural resources. And finally, our visitor services, which includes our patrol staff, uh, they implement all the volunteer projects, and of course, they report their work to the natural resources as well. Uh, the one department that um, I see is not listed here, which I should update, is our public affairs. Uh, they really help us out a lot with our education and outreach to the public about the work we do, the why we do it, and how we do it. So our biological surveys that we perform, uh, prior to any new project, we do an initial biological survey by a biologist, um, either in-house, uh, with somebody from the Natural Resources Department or we'll uh, uh, contract out. Um, after that, if it is a uh, typically reoccurring um, project, uh, in grasslands we go back out every about five years and in brushlands and woodlands, uh, forest areas we do every three years. For buildings, uh, many of our strategies include, you know, making sure that uh, people are taking out their trash, so sanitation, uh, excluding the animals from the buildings, trapping when needing to, uh, also using soap sprays and maybe diatomaceous earth. Uh, one of the more tricky situations we do have, though, is uh, wood rats. So it's a, a special status species. 
um, and they love to uh, find our uh, housing that we have that's out in the middle of nowhere. So a lot of the property that we are acquiring, because we are still acquiring a lot of land, uh, does come with some uh, pretty um, not so well taken care of housing. Um, so we have a lot of wood rats nests and also bats um, in these areas. So we want to make sure that uh, we are, if we need to, relocating these wood mat rats nests we're excluding them from the buildings, um, and we're also doing that for uh, bats as well. We do have one rodenticide that we have on our approved list, um, which is basically vitamin D. It's uh, not one of the you know second generational um, ones that have issues, uh, and we only use that for urgent public health issues. Uh, since I've been at the district since 2015, I've only had one request to actually use it, uh, which we actually ended up denying. Uh, and the reason why is the, the person did not want to use snap traps because she was scared that her cat would get step would step into the snap trap. Um, and so uh, I I let her know that you know this wasn't really acceptable, um, and that we could get different types of snap traps um, that would be protective of her cat. Um, which we did install those ones. Um, and so uh, we were able to really take care of the situation without going to the rodenticide area. Uh, that said, it is still on our list and we don't foresee ever taking this off. Really, we wanna make sure that if we need to use it uh, due to health, health reasons that we can. Uh, in terms of our recreational facilities, uh, a lot of it is about uh, encroaching vegetation and or nuisance animals. Um, so a lot of brush cutting, tractor mowing. Uh, we do some stump, crump, tr stump cut stump treatment with herbicides. Um, and then we do have, uh, for in terms of wildlife, um, wasps and bees and rattlesnake relocations. Um, in terms of the bees, uh, you know, our first go-to is, you know, can we just take the trail and uh, close it down for the time being while the bees are there? Uh, if we can't, um, for whatever reason, can't reroute it or can't close it down, uh, we like to try to send somebody in to actually dig up the nest. Um, I also uh, have a list of volunteers that have uh, beehives at their house, they'll actually come in and do collections of bees for us. We've had this happen twice so far uh, where volunteers have come in and that allows us to do that without having to go in with an insecticide um, and spray the, the nest if we don't have to. Our rangeland, a lot of the work that we do is in terms of weeds, uh, rangeland weeds, so a lot of different thistles that we have on our, our property. And then uh, a lot of encroaching brush. So we have a lot of coyote brush coming into um, a lot of these areas of grasslands. Uh, our our rangeland <clears throat> is managed by a different program. It's called the Conservation Grazing Program. Um, and the idea behind the grazing program is that we stock it at a rate that is uh, pretty low and we are trying to increase the biodiversity of our area. So this is not a, uh, a cattle production area. We're not looking to see how fat we can make our cows, but rather uh, can we enhance the areas that we have with the use of cows? Uh, they are sort of taking over for the tule elk that are no longer in this area anymore. Um, and so uh, we use them uh, where we can. Uh, it also helps to reduce the amount of fuels that we have um, in our grasslands. Uh, so we do mowing, we do spot spraying, we do some trapping of some animals. Uh, at one of our, our ranches, we do have some feral pigs, which we um, have in the past done some active trapping of. Um, and in addition, in our agricultural areas is where we have a lot of our California red-legged frogs, uh, since we have stock ponds for the, for the cattle. Unfortunately, over the years, um, some people have released either bullfrogs, uh, fish, and or uh, uh, different turtles that are not native to the area. Uh, we even have one snapping turtle at one of our ponds that we are trying to get out. Um, 
So for in terms of the spot spraying that we do, uh, and just to let you know, MidPen does not allow the use of broadcast spray in any form. Um, but in terms of the spot spraying, uh, we make sure that anybody who's doing any herbicide work on our lands, they have to have a QAC or a QAL. And they also have to go through a IPM training uh, that MidPen puts on on an annual basis. It's both a pesticide safety training that is mandated by Department of Pesticide Regulations, uh, but also provides insight into the IPM program of the district. In natural areas, we're dealing with a lot of invasive plants. Um, I believe this year we worked on approximately about 50 different species. Um, Tom can correct me if I'm wrong since he just wrote up the report. Um, and then we also deal with a lot of sudden oak death. Uh, that we have a couple sites that are, are a couple preserves that are very heavily hit with sudden oak death. And so we are doing uh, a lot of research on sudden oak death on how, how to treat that. And the thing to keep in mind in our natural areas, which is the largest percentage of the work that we do, you know, our restoration really focuses on the natural systems and processes. We're not trying to go back in time and putting the, the, the land back, you know, pre-European or anything like that. So in the natural areas, uh, we use pulling, digging, cutting, mowing, flaming, grazing, trapping, and chemical use. Um, so a, a suite of IPM tools that we use. Um, and each one of our work sites um, is vetted through that IPM coordination team that I talked about. Um, and making sure that we are being effective um, and safe at the same time. So I've talked a lot about pesticides and it probably has led you to believe that we use a lot of pesticides when in fact we really don't. Um, about 10% of our hours on average is about uh, is using pesticides, but over the past two, three years, that's really dropped dramatically. We're now at about two or three percent of our time. Uh, but when we use them is uh, to prevent erosion and to protect infrastructure. Um, so if we have a hillside filled with uh, French broom that if we were to use weed wrenches on, it would do a lot of ground disturbance uh, that might end up causing a lot of erosion. Well, we will probably go in there and actually spray that instead. Uh, for species that re-sprout that we can't dig out as well, so eucalyptus trees, uh, the cotoneaster I, I talked about earlier, um, we will actually do uh, cut stump treatments on those. Um, poisonous or hazardous plants. So uh, lots of people um, can have allergic reactions uh, to certain plant species, uh, including, say, cotoneaster, uh, or not cotoneaster, I'm sorry, um, poison hemlock. Um, and so we want to make sure that the, that it's safe for the people that are working around those. Uh, also in our our uh, our recreational facilities, we want to make sure that people are being safe around around poison oak. So sometimes we will do selective poison oak removal. In cultural resource sites um, where we don't want to do any ground disturbance, that's another area that we'll use pesticides. And then of course we want to minimize worker exposure to other hazards. Uh, sometimes we have our workers that uh, the, the acute uh, hazard is much more um, uh, scary than the uh, long-term effects, the possible long-term effects of pesticide use. So we're thinking about roadsides, hazardous soils such as serpentine soils or steep and loose slopes. Um, and then the last one, which I think is really important, which is really often underlooked, is we want to make sure that the human residence times, especially in the natural resource areas, that uh, that is decreased. Um, there's more and more science coming out about the effects on wildlife when there is humans in the area. And so by allowing the use of pesticides, we can get in and out of an area very, very quickly. Um, and decrease that residence time that humans are in there. And uh, this is something that I think is very important that's often uh, underlooked or, or overlooked. So the chemicals that we do use, uh, Roundup, Milestone, Envoy Plus, Garland for Ultra, Capstone, Polaris, and Transline, each one has their um, superstar ability and each one also has some you know downfalls that that come with them um 
our board is very interested, as is you know many people around the world, about reducing our Roundup usage. And we've actually done an incredible job to reduce that. Uh, I believe it was a year and a half ago, we actually went through all of our pesticide sites that uh, we were using Roundup at and made the determination, is there another product that we can use that um, we can substitute it for? Um, there was quite a few. We actually ended up adding um, both Garlon for Ultra and Capstone to our, our toolbox um, to lessen our need to use Roundup. We also looked at all of the pesticide sites and made a determination where we didn't need to use pesticides anymore. Uh, a good example is at our Lahana Preserve where we've been working on Purple Star Thistle. We've been doing herbicide spray on that for quite a while. Um, and it's at the point now that we actually didn't use any herbicides over a large swath of land um, for, I believe, the past two years. And just keep in mind, herbicides is only one tool in our tool bag. Um, here you can see us doing some cut stump herbicide treatment of woody vegetation. Uh, this is something we like to do, especially if we are close to um, a trailhead. It really reduces both the drift and the potential for somebody to come in contact with it. And I mentioned before about sudden oak death. This is something that we've been working on in terms of different treatment methods. Uh, we're just finishing up one of our studies about the use of a fungicide um, for the protection of heritage oaks. I just wanted to highlight that. And then last, I just want to talk very briefly about our developing wildland fire resiliency program. Now, this used to be housed under our, I, our IPM program, but it's being taken out and being um, uh, enlarged in scale. And so we have a vegetation management plan, a prescribed fire plan. Uh, we're producing pre-fire and advisory maps uh, in case of any emergency use, and then uh, a monitoring plan of these areas. So proactively, we're monitoring um, the areas for fuel loads and weather conditions. We're also doing non-fire vegetation management along the roads and trails, um, and we hope to use prescribed fire in the future. In terms of emergency response, uh, we're making these pre-plans. These plans are shared with fire agencies so they know uh, what infrastructure is there that they can use. So can they get a type three wildland fire um, engine on the road? Uh, is there water sources somewhere, a pond that they can draw from? But it also has these resource advisor maps. And these resource advisors maps are also used by CAL FIRE um, and other entities. Uh, to let them know that, hey, uh, yes, there are two ponds here, but one of them has really good frogs. Uh, please don't use that one, use the other one. Of course, these maps do not dictate um, to CAL FIRE how to fight a fire, but it's just an advisory to them. Um, it also has listed on there, and these have been uh, reviewed by other fire ecologists um, and vetted by CAL FIRE about where the best places to put in fire lines if we needed to put in a fire line. Um, does it make sense for us to bulldoze a site when we know we have an archaeological cultural site there? Or can we redo that, that dozer line, you know, 100 yards to the north or something like that? And so these advisor maps actually show where uh, uh, the uh, dozer lines uh, might be beneficial. Uh, the vegetation management plan is divided into two parts, fire management and ecosystem resiliency. Fire management is uh, really to assist fire agencies to get into an area and or to help the public get out of an area. Um, and then ecosystem resiliency is to make sure that the fuel loads aren't as high as um, they are right now to reduce that down so that way when a fire comes through, it's not catastrophic. Here's what some of these plans look like. Um, so this is existing a potential treatment at one of our preserves, Bear Creek Redwoods. Um, and after we went through and um, sort of segmented off all the different areas that we could do work, we then prioritize these areas into tiers. So we have uh, on this map shows the tier one and tier two areas of Bear Creek Redwoods. Uh, so these are the areas that we would wanna work first prior to the other areas. Right now, we have the ability to do about 200 acres of fire work. Uh, this new program would increase it to about 1,000 acres. 
And so for the monitoring and everything, uh, we do use CalFlora's Weed Manager. Um, it's been a great resource for us, and we encourage you know lots of agencies to use this to um, help see where ev everybody else is doing work. Um, so we use this pretty extensively along with a lot of our partners down on the peninsula. I talked about about how the volunteers are pretty in uh, you know they're invaluable to us. Uh, here, this was for this latest year was at 32%, but typically they're more on the 40%. Uh, we've had an increase in number of hours by our contractors because we've actually had an increase in the number of mitigation sites we've had to do uh, due to some capital improvement projects that we've had. Um, Here's a breakdown of our actual treatment methods. Like I said, uh, our herbicide is down to about 3%, 6% uh, digging, 7% cutting. Uh, we do brush cutting and mowing, uh, but the vast majority is pulling. About 78% of our work is manual removal. And so finally, you know, why do we do this? Uh, yes, it's to get people out and about on our preserves but also it's about all these special status species that we have. So here's just a, a few of the rare species that we have, the uh, marble merlets, the monarch butterflies, mountain lady slipper. Um, so we have uh, quite a few number of different special status species that we are trying to protect and take care of. Um, this isn't, uh, you know, for my enjoyment necessarily. Um, it's not even for my kids' enjoyment, but really it's for my kids' kids' enjoyment. So I want to make sure that they have the opportunity to see this stuff, um, not only for themselves, but also just, you know, it's it's nature. It's, it's our duty to help and protect and steward these lands um, for these other species that are having impacts. And the vast majority of these impacts are human caused. And with that, I come to an end. Um, here's my contact information. Again, my name is Cody C. Fuentes Winter, and I'm the Supervisory Vegetation Ecologist. Uh, my email and phone number are up there. And if you have any questions or comments or concerns, I would love to take them. Thank you so much, Cody. I'm going to uh, stop the recording now.